Okay, everybody, welcome back to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. Today we're going to uh, continue on a, a group of closely related topics that we've not only dealt with before on this broadcast, but it's, it's a concept, a set of ideas that I have made to a great extent the center of my career, the center of my research as a writer and a historian. And it is what I've entitled this particular broadcast, this talk, The uh, Deconstruction of Republicanism. Now, the concept of deconstruction is, is a common one. It, it centers around the idea that the public meanings and understandings behind a phenomenon are not, in fact, true. Um, they are epiphenomenon. They're, they're based on far more fundamental and more or less secret, uh, secret in the sense that people would rather not talk about them, secret in the sense that they're subconscious, and secret in that, you know, if they were spoken of in public, it would cause such a level of um, cognitive dissonance that it would drive people crazy. That's a very concept of deconstruction, and uh, it's a useful tool for us, especially given the fact that it has been used by the sort of fashionable left in academia for a long time. It's been used by them, however, very selectively. They'll never use it against themselves. They'll never use it against their allies. They'll never use it against the left, although they have been more or less interesting in how they've used it against the state and, and other things. So the concept of deconstruction is, is a useful tool. It's a useful method, um, uh, although largely abused in, in academia, because really anything that, that academia touches, it, it destroys, at least in, in history and social sciences. The concept of republicanism, however, is far more problematic. There is, nor has there ever been, any real definition of what a republic is. Um, people use the word all the time. A lot of stupid conservatives who talk about you know, America is a republic, not a democracy. They could define democracy okay, some kind of majority rule. But when you ask them to define a republic, they don't have a clue. Um, sometimes they'll stutter and, and they'll, they'll mention something about a Bill of Rights, or that there are certain things that a government can't do. Of course, that's also true in, in democracies. Um, there really has never been any particular definition of what a republic is, uh, and, and uh, what has been put forth over the centuries has always been very controversial. Now, I want to just say, for our purposes here, that I'm following the old Russian Slavophile philosophy of history. And that, in very general terms, there are two forms of constitution. Form number one is a land empire. Um, it, it uh, you know, typical examples of this might be uh, Assyria, um, Persia, Rome, Russia, uh, Germany, and then there are sea-based empires, and that would refer to states like. Tyre and Carthage and Venice and Great Britain and the United States and maybe even Japan. And I'm willing to use that um, simple typology as a very important way that I, I try to interpret important elements in world history, um, but I also use it when I talk about republics. When I use the word republic, I think my, my main concern is that a republican system is a trading society. It's a society that is based on formal legal equality simply because the only thing that matters is making money and dominating others. And since anyone can do that, there's no use for a monarch. There's no use for an aristocracy. Uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, tried to define a republic, and he went back and forth on his various definitions. But one of the most central concerns that he had is that you can't have a republican system if there are any institutionalized ties of dependence. And this is why he thought that America was such a special place, because there's so much land that anybody, really, can become a landowner. And once you're a landowner, you grow your own food, and you're a part of the local community, and, and, and you, you have your own stake in society, you become a free man. For Thomas Jefferson, of course, the only free man is one who was a property owner and therefore who didn't have to depend on anybody else for their income. 
Therefore, if you worked in a factory or if you were a sharecropper or something like that, you were not a free man. It might not be your fault, but you're still not free. You are not free because you are dependent on someone for your livelihood. And therefore, you have to watch your behavior. You have to watch what you say. You have to keep a close watch over your opinions because if you piss this person off, you may lose everything. Hence, such a person is not free. So by Jefferson's definition, almost nobody in modern America is free if we, if we use that as the central issue in, in a republic. Now, Jefferson's view may be very intelligent, but I just don't see how it has any connection to republican government as such. So when I talk about deconstructing a republican system, I'm referring to the relatively small trading societies and trading cities ruled by an oligarchy that uses the rhetoric of freedom and constitutionalism and equality before the law as a means of justifying their property, their power, their complete domination over everybody else. Now, what I want to talk about relative to that is Venice. For those of us who are supporters of the Byzantine Roman Empire in the Middle Ages and who view the Byzantine Roman Empire as you know your archetypal land empire based on those values of, of loyalty and virtue that are central to the land empire where acquisitiveness and individualism are um, uh, the main concerns of republics and trading societies. No historian denies that Venice is one of these societies that really reached the apogee of what a republican system is. It called itself a republic. It was proud of its alleged freedom. It uh, was proud of its uh, industrious population. And of course, like all republics, it defines success solely in financial, financial terms, or alternatively, being able to translate money into political power or respect or prestige or something like that. Now, um, Venice, um, starting in the year 1000 AD, every Feast of the Ascension, the independent church, remember the, the Venetians were able to buy their independence from the Pope of Rome and had their own patriarch for a long time. Venice had a ritual that it performed at 12 noon every Ascension Day from the year 1000 un until um, the slow decline of the Italian city-states in the beginning of the Enlightenment. It was called the Marriage of the Sea ritual. Uh, more specifically, it was the marriage of the doge, or the, or the chief executive of, of the Venetian state, with the Adriatic. Now, I want to use this ritual as a means of at least partially defining what a republic is, and what that old Tyre-style uh, trading city really is, and what it's truly based on, and therefore what both the British and the American uh, mercantile mentality is based on. And uh, this marriage of the dog in the sea is one of the central rituals, uh, and, and relatively recently it's been resurrected, and it's kind of a just a stupid tourist attraction now, uh, but it's um, it's it's something that came to define the 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 overall constitution and sense of self of the Venetian Republic. Um, I want to make something else clear. Um, I tried to define deconstruction. I gave. A, an unsatisfactory account of republicanism. Of course, there is no satisfactory account of republicanism. But now I have to mention the concept of constitution. Most people, when they hear the word constitution relative to political societies, they think of a piece of paper, and uh, it has all of these uh, basic fundamental laws on it, what a government can do and what it can't do. Traditionally, of course, that's not the definition of a constitution. A uh, constitution is the sum total of all of the traditions and customs and ways of thought and the basic consensus on all forms of activity that have some economic or social or political significance. Maybe a small piece of it can be written down on a piece of paper. Um, you know, I mean, the American Constitution really doesn't say very much. And this is something that the, the anti-federalists, you know, ripped the Constitution to pieces, saying that it is so brief it doesn't really say anything. But the American Constitution, uh, at least at the founding generation, there is no constitution anymore. Um, there's simply too many different people and languages living here. There is no consensus. There is no agreement, uh, unless it's imposed by force. 
So there is no constitution in the, in the true literal sense of the word, but there is this couple of pages that politicians make um, uh, some kind of obeisance to, and of course it's absolutely meaningless. Um, but, but the concept of a constitution is far broader than um, a couple of pages that the American Constitution, for example, is, is written upon. A constitution is this very broad-based sense of how a group of people have come to understand themselves from the point of view of social and political life. So, but I want to say here is that this marriage of the sea ritual that was done every year in Venice was very much the symbol, in the true sense of the word symbol, it was the very manifestation in ritualized form of the entire Venetian self-concept. And I'm embarrassed to say that only relatively recently have I come across this ritual. And not only that, but why this ritual was so absolutely central to how Venice understood itself and understood its role in the world. And once I read what this ritual was, um, I began to realize that this ritual has a lot to do with how republics, these trading and mercantile cities like Carthage and Tyre, um, have understood themselves over the centuries. And so the marriage of the sea ritual, which I'll call it for short, the marriage of the sea ritual is one of the central um, constitutional ideas of republicanism. Now, I also want to mention that this occult ritual had the full endorsement of the papacy in Rome, specifically Pope Alexander III, who um, gave his uh, blessing on this ritual for the sake of maintaining Venice as an ally. And so this is, whether we like it or not, a part of Venetian Catholic culture, uh, although certainly it's a negation of everything that uh, people like St. Augustine had uh, had claimed the church truly is and truly is all about. Civilization, in the worst sense of the term, is about the domination of chaos. The kind of the sort of um, quasi-gnostic point of view looks at nature as this chaotic and oppressive force. So civilization, science, mathematics, the state, all of these come into existence, among many other reasons, for the sake of controlling this chaos. The chaos can represent the common people who need to be controlled in Republican thinking. In Venice's case, it does mean that, but it also means the ocean, and the sea, the Adriatic Sea, or the, or the Mediterranean, or the Atlantic. These are also seen as chaotic, untamable elements. But since Venice, Venice itself is really just a handful of very small islands, it doesn't have much land. The entire Venetian world centers around domination of the sea. And more specifically, from a, from a non-theoretical point of view, um, it was a ritual to dominate the sea, both in the sense that the sea is this chaotic thing, you could never control it, but also it referred to the Slavs. It referred to the Slavs from the Balkans who uh, were regularly at war with Venice. The Slavs were considered identical to the sea in the sense that they were chaotic, they were uncivilized, and they were barbarians who needed to be controlled. So uh, right off the bat, the marriage of the sea is, is more than just this way that, that, that Venice ritualized its domination over the ocean, but that it ritualized its domination over those it viewed as inferior. That included the Slavs of the Balkans, it included the Vikings, and it included their own common population. So the Republican idea so far, the way Venice understands it, is about knowledge over numbers and control over nature. So, so far, it's not that big of a deal because of Venice's very precarious uh, geographic position being uh, a set of very small sandy islands um, completely surrounded by water and, of course, being completely impregnated by water. So the entire Venetian mentality is how do you tame the untamable? And this ritual slowly developed as a way to uh, make that a reality, or at least ritualize that reality. But we're not just talking about nature. We're also talking about people who are viewed as primal people 
which is to say that they are both to be feared and they are also to be pitied, they are also to be controlled. The Slavs and the Vikings uh, were to civilization uh, what the sea was to science. It's something that was feared, something that was unpredictable, something that needed to be controlled. And of course, in the Venetian case, uh, navy and sea power, this was the monarch. This was the method of control, was the building of a strong mercantile navy, the building of a strong militarized navy. So in broader terms, it refers to mercantile republican civilization against who they call pirates, whether it be Balkan Slavs or the Vikings. And what the Republican mercantile mentality in Venice understood itself to be was the regularity and control over those things that it considered to be inherently chaotic, and that is the natural world. Now, of course, the problem is that even the Greeks, and before them the um, civilizations of, of Egypt and Mesopotamia, had long since understood the natural world as ordered. Plato and Aristotle both understood the natural world as an ordered whole, and that the divine presence, speaking generally, was the cause and even purpose of that natural, uh, the natural order. So far from nature being, being something that was chaotic, it was just the opposite. Nature is, in fact, an ordered whole. The ancient world fully understood that and developed some very, very complicated mathematics and in astronomy and physics um, from Egypt straight up until the, um, the time uh, late Athens of Plato and Aristotle. It should also be noted that, of course, Athens is another classic example of a sea power, while Sparta is a classic example of a land power, uh, both in terms of its, of its priorities as well as in terms of its mentality. Plato wrote um, the, the Statesman and then later in his life the Laws as a way to make an attack on the seafaring power of Tyre, of Athens, the Athens that will eventually, of course, put Socrates to death. So, um, so the point is here that there's, a, that there's another ingredient. Venice was a literate society, for better or for worse, it was a scientific society. It realized that while saying in public that the sea and all of the, these are symbols of chaos, the fact is they did know that the natural whole is in fact an ordered, um, an ordered unit based on understandable laws. The very, the very structure of, of Venetian ships and, and navigational technology strongly suggested that they knew that. But what we're really then talking about is the fact that the Venetian oligarchy viewed chaos as the ignorant masses. The ignorant masses that needed to be controlled and manipulated, they did the same in Venice as they did in Florence under the Medici. Now it wasn't nature that was chaotic. They knew by their own technology, they knew that nature was ordered and regular and dependable. No, it was people that were um, that were uh, uh, savage and ignorant, and therefore it took a it took a uh, Gnostic oligarchy that understands the laws of nature to then impose their power and their money upon the masses. Now, part of the proof of this is that when the ships go out in, into the Adriatic and the ring gets thrown into the water to symbolize the marriage of Venice and the sea and the dog in the sea. Um, the, the ship was rowed, it was not sailed. The ship was rowed by a handful of elite sailors, but it was very explicit that these sailors represented slaves. The ship of the Venetian state was put in motion by slaves. That was very clear in the ritual, and that proves that what they're really talking about is not that nature is chaotic. If nature was chaotic, you couldn't row anywhere. The very fact of rowing shows the, the, the proof of certain theorems of physics. They knew that. Of course, a society that advanced was very aware of that, as were the Persians, as were the Greeks. Uh, that's not an issue. But the fact that these sailors that were doing the rowing were, in a ceremonial way, acting as slaves, and the ship itself was a symbol of the Venetian state, 
The fact is, is that the Venetian state was moved by slaves. The rowing, the, the hard work of the state was done by slaves. Slavery is therefore a normal aspect of the Republican order. And it's the ship itself that comes to supplant the throne of the Doga, the ducal, the ducal throne of the uh, leader of the Venetian oligarchy. Okay, uh, we're going to finish up this deconstruction of the Venetian Republic and republics in general when we return. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Orthodox Nationalist. The title of this particular broadcast is The Deconstruction of Republicanism or Deconstructing Republics. And specifically, we're talking about the marriage of the sea ritual at the height of the Venetian oligarchy's power over the Greek Empire, starting about the year 1000. Um, and I, I ended just before the, the break by mentioning the fact that the ritual itself, done on Ascension Day at 12 noon, where the uh, ship representing the ship of state is rowed out to um, into the Adriatic a short way, and a ring is tossed into the water, representing the domination of Venice over the sea. Of course, that's not entirely true. It represents the domination of knowledge, and knowledge there is defined as knowledge of, of money and navigation and political science over the ignorant masses, those who are born and destined to be slaves. Now, this is a pagan occult ceremony. Even though the Patriarch of Venice was usually on board, it received the blessing of Pope Alexander III. The fact is, is that this was an occult ritual to refer to the domination of mercantile rationality over those who either rejected that rationality or who were too stupid to understand that rationality. Pagan symbols were strewn and flags over the ship. Uh, the four symbols were justice, earth, sea, and peace. So the marriage of earth and sea, the marriage of stability, represented by uh, gnosis, the domination of will, the will of the oligarchy over everything else, and the sea, which is the everything else, will lead to peace, and that peace will therefore lead to justice. It should also be noted that one of the most visible uh, uh, symbols to be found, I, I believe was normally found on the very bow of the ship, was the Egyptian Sphinx, which you know has had many uh, different interpretations attached to it over the years, but the very fact is that there were far more pagan and occult symbols on the ship representing the Venetian state than there were uh, Christian symbols. And the Christian symbols, or I should say Roman Catholic symbols, were, um, were really more window dressing than anything else. The only reason that the papacy uh, blessed and supported this uh, ritual was because, number one, it, it meant that, that Venice would continue to help finance the papacy, that uh, Venice would not turn against the papacy, and that Venice could then be used continually to fight against the Byzantine Empire. So, as always with the Roman papacy, it's only a matter of political power. It was a state that, on occasion, had certain uh, Christian elements attached to it, but primarily it was a state. But it was a chaotic state, and the result is, is that it needed the money from Venice and, um, and Milan and um, Florence, Siena to some extent, uh, to make it happen. So the papacy, it should be noted, uh, and not just Alexander, but his successors as well, um, put their blessing on this particular uh, pagan ritual. So you had the uh, symbols of the earth and sea marrying each other justice and peace marrying each other and then the entity that so to speak made uh, uh, made that marriage a uh, solemn was the Egyptian Sphinx now as there are four entities that are represented symbolically on the ship that represents the Venetian state there are also four colors the main three colors are red white and blue um, these are the colors of the symbols 
these are the colors of the flags and the sails. These are the colors of everything. I mean, this is a this is a massively festooned ship representing Venice. But there is a purple, um, purple being a synthetic color, not a natural color. Um, it, I should say it's not a primary color. Uh, is a symbol of control. Now the Venetians didn't believe in in royalty because that would be a negation of the republican and mercantile mentality. It is a non-primary color. It's a rare color. Uh, it could only be found in the sea. I believe it could be found in certain squid have a purplish kind of uh, ink that they squirt at people. But purple is the symbol of control. It, it's not so much that they reject royalty, but they reject traditional Christian monarchy. For them, there's only one monarch, and that, at least in exoteric terms, it's money. In esoteric terms, it's Lucifer, uh, Lucifer or um, Prometheus. Um, at the same time, throughout the decorations on the ship, you will also see the continued interaction of silver and gold, so-called electrum. Gold is the ancient alchemical symbol of the sun, of rationality, of masculinity, of Gnostic dominance over the ignorant, while silver is a symbol of woman, the moon, the sea, that which is always changing and flowing. The marriage of the sun and moon is an ancient um, alchemical doctrine of absolute dominance over the elements, where that which is unchanging, represented by gold, is infused with that which is constantly changing, represented by the moon or silver. It's the unity of opposites. It's dialectical motion. But most of all, it's the fact that at least in public, it is the will of the oligarchy that now is absolutely dominant over all things, dominant to the extent that it can... Um, it can unify opposites. The ritual uh, consists of, among other things, the statement that says, We wed thee, O sea, as token of our perpetual sovereignty. But we have to understand that wedding the sea, in this particular case, is not an equal contract. Wedding the sea means that now the Venetian oligarchy, represented by this ship, with all of these symbols attached to it, now has absolute ownership, dominance, and control of all um, those elements which are considered chaotic. Since nature is not chaotic, it refers to those that are considered inferior to the Venetian oligarchy. That's why the ship is rowed by slaves, or by people pretending to be slaves, acting as slaves. So the common worker, the common individual, those belonging to races like Slavs and Vikings and, and, and Nordics in general, uh, are savage and ignorant, and therefore this wedding is about the use of our navy to destroy all of those who oppose us. This is the mentality of what, over the years, um, have come to be known as the black nobility. And I agree that at least in some sense, this black nobility, of course, is, is black in the sense that it's a shadow. It's not an actual nobility, but it attaches itself to the true aristocracy of Europe and elsewhere. But it's not really an aristocracy because it's an oligarchy. And in Aristotle's world, oligarchy and aristocracy are complete opposites. One is control based on virtue and ability and experience. The other is control based on money and, and uh, deviance. And there's, of course, truth to that. So the black nobility means that these are the shadow, the dialectical opposite of the actual real nobility of, of, of Europe. Okay, so now there are three entities that are absolutely saturated with symbolism. The sea, number one, the ship, number two, and the city, number three. The city, we have to understand, um, refers to what the oligarchy refer to as freedom in contradistinction to life on the land, life of the nobility, life of those elements in society that do not see material gain as the sole definition of success. 
when you study ancient occult symbolism, you notice a few things about the concept of a city. That, number one, the city was always the home of divinity. In this case, the divinity refers to the Gnostic will that imposes its power upon those inferior to it. But the home of the god is the exact same thing, especially in, in Greek mythology. Uh, is, the home of the god is the same place where you deposited your money in a bank. This has always been the problem of paganism, is that the temples were also banks. So if you denied that these gods have any meaning whatsoever, you caused a run on the banks. This is the real reason that Socrates was executed. Socrates went up in front of the Athenian assembly and said, this is all nonsense. These gods are not true. There is only Logos. But to the extent that people believed him, they then withdrew their money from the temple. So that meant that the currency was in trouble. That meant that the Athenian state was in trouble. That meant that this guy needed to be killed. The city is also a symbol of evolution, scientific doctrine of evolution. The, symbol of, the concept of evolution has been around as long as civilization. Plato makes reference to it. Aristarchus makes reference to it. It's been around. Uh, Ovid in the Metamorphoses makes reference to it. It's about this synthesis between ambition and magic. This concept that our continued, continued interaction with those that we conquer will, come, will, will, will create a new super race of people. The city was always founded through death. The city was always founded through murder, whether it be in, in the Roman uh, legend of, of Romulus or the, the Old Testament concept of the murder of Abel and then Cain went on to build the city. city sto stories of how cities came into existence, they all came into existence because someone was killed and then that blood was used as sort of the seed to create this civilization. And it produces sameness, it produces conformity. So, in, in at least the Western occult tradition, the concept of the city uh, is multi-layered in its symbolism, especially given, you know, the time we're talking about the High Middle Ages, or the period just slightly before the High Middle Ages, um, these, this kind of symbolism was, was extremely important to the dominant, dominant people in, in Italy. Uh, this was a, a huge aspect of their education. The interpretation of symbols was almost everything that these people did in terms of how they viewed, how they looked at nature, how they looked at people, how they looked at shapes, how they looked at natural bodies and everything else. And the fact is that uh, the city is the very definition, the very symbol of modernity in almost every respect. Now, the symbol of the sea, to some extent, um, isn't chaos. And, and this is, you know, the, the, the exoteric element here is that the sea is chaos and our navy will dominate it. That isn't true because the European concept of, of the sea symbolism really refers to, among other things, overcoming of barriers. The sea really isn't a barrier if you have a powerful navy. It's not that it's chaotic. We know that there are natural causes that, 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 um, that have an effect on the sea that's, that's not a mystery. It wasn't a mystery to the Athenians. It wasn't a mystery to the Phoenicians. And it's certainly no mystery to uh, their successors in Venice. To a great extent, the sea served as a baseline for measurements. This was the very opposite of chaos. The sea was not chaotic. People were. Um, and yet at the same time, the sea represented the collective subconscious of the population. It The sea represented the secrets that were hidden in the mentality of those who ruled. It was formless. It was in motion. But that is a far cry from saying that it is therefore identical with chaos. The fact is, is that the sea was one of the main early symbols for the development of the world state. For the Romans, it may have been the road but for seafaring peoples, it was the sea itself. The sea is a barrier that is not a barrier. In fact, it's the opposite of a barrier because it was much easier to travel over sea than it was over land. Sea was a symbol of the globe. Sea was a symbol of global government because whoever controlled the sea controlled the world. 
It is much easier to transport goods over the ocean than it is over land, especially back then. And then the synthesis of the two, the synthesis of the sea and the city is to be found in the ultimate expression of Venetian and Republican uh, uh, mentalities, and that is the ship. The ship. The ship is a bringing together. If, if, if you study the symbolism carefully, it is that the ship is the very concept of that third entity in a dialectical motion. The ship is a synthesis of two previous opposites. So the ship has on it the marriage of the earth and the sea. It has on it silver and gold. And yet the ship itself is that entity that brings all of it together into a single oligarchic unit. It means integration. It means domination. It's a ritualization that ultimately trade and money and power that comes from that will rule the world if it doesn't already. And therefore, empires like Germany or Russia or Byzantium or China will be destroyed. And then will be, as we would say today, uh, Britain and America and Japan, uh, they will rise in its place. The ship, because of its very special position, not only clearly in, in Venetian culture, in the Italian city-states, but also its significance in trade, its importance in dominating others, where you know a tiny group of people, whether they live in England or whether they live in Venice or whether they live on, uh, on Tyre or any of these other small islands that become immensely powerful, way out of proportion to their numbers and to their size, it's because of the ship. The ship is the ultimate expression of global dominance. But because of this, it's also an ancient symbol for expansion. It transcends nature. It transcends existence. You can travel long distances in a fairly short period of time. It's as if nature no longer exists. You now dominate it and control it. And the faster the ship the more technology and forced labor that goes into creating and building the ship, the more nature seems irrelevant. So this whole concept of this ritual be having something to do with the sea as chaotic is nonsense. That's what you know the tourist brochures tell uh, people who go over there and witness this every year. And this is you know happening also now every year. Uh, over the last few years now, Venice is trying to boost its um, tourism, so this is a big deal. Europeans are going over and seeing this every Ascension Day. But the ship means that typical quantities like numbers of people and size and power, and they, they no longer matter. If you control the seas, you control everything, even if there's just a handful of you. Sea power will dominate land power any day. Now, that may or may not be true. The point is, that was the official ideology of the Venetian Republic. And needless to say, all of this then has to wind up having something to do, centrally speaking, with science and technology. As Venice and the Italian city-states become more and more dominant, as they invent and develop the very concept, at least in our modern world, of international banking, they realize fairly early on that whoever has the fastest ships will automatically dominate economically. That also means that it isn't the size of your army or navy, it is the size of your scientific establishment. And this is the mentality that developed into the Renaissance, and this is why the Renaissance ultimately was Italian. It originally was Italian because this understanding that nature is not a barrier if you're able to control it. It can be a barrier. It's a barrier for the inferiors, people who are symbolized by uh, lead, in uh, the, the alchemical mentality. Nature is something not to be worked with. It's not to be venerated. It's not to be loved. It's not to be hated. It's to be dominated. And if anything speaks to the very theoretical nature, the very constitutional nature of what it is to be modern, it's this Venetian ritual. And this dialectical motion of the three symbols, the city and the sea, the home of the god overcoming global barriers. Domination, evolution, and death overcoming formlessness. The subconscious becoming conscious. That's the dialectic of the sea-city clash. But of course, everything dialectically speaking, it's not about real opposition. 
It's about two entities finding out that they're really one and the same, and that uh, realization is to be found in the concept of the ship, which is, in its very ancient symbolism, about integration, bringing together opposites, and therefore, in so doing, dominating everybody around you. So now, what does this all mean? Why did I go through this 45 minutes worth of, of discussion on this? Number one, I'm saying that this is the constitution of republican government. It has nothing to do with government. It has to do with science, technology, trade, money, and the worship of dead matter, as Michael Hoffman would say. The worship of dead matter. God is nowhere to be found because this is about the will, not of man, abstractly, but the will of the elite imposing itself upon the world. Number two, all of this rhetoric about equality before the law and individual rights, all of this absolute nonsense, and the worst of all, the free market, which has probably never existed, even in Adam Smith's writings, it's essentially a state of nature argument, sort of a thought experiment, what he calls perfect competition. None of these have any real bearing on how republics function. It is oligarchy, it is power. This is something that Thomas Jefferson figures out, and he figures it out in his letters to people like Thomas Pickering and others in the late um, 1810s and the early 1820s. Thomas Jefferson finally figures this out and says, no, America is doomed, because Hamilton and his mentality, more than Hamilton personally, is going to win. And if that mentality wins, then there is no republic. If Jefferson is going to define a republic as that which has its citizens in a state of mutual freedom and non-dependence, first of all, it's a complete negation of this Venetian idea. But also, number two, it's very, very hard to maintain. If And, and this, this whole issue, you know, um, Jefferson's le uh, letters in, in the 1810s and 18, early 1820s, it are, are very, very instructive. That's why no one reads them. Uh, he is very pessimistic. If the bank is going to be imposed on America, which of course is a big issue at the time, it's over. Venice will win. Our landed republic will lose. Now, he uses the word republic in that sense. I know it's confusing, but the word doesn't have any meaning, so they kind of throw it around. I I'm not going to worry so much about that. Thomas Jefferson didn't necessarily view America as another tire or another Carthage. He viewed it as a land power. And that was, that was um, uh, reflected in his central economic concern, and that is to make sure that every rational citizen has access to land and private property that would therefore make him free relative to everybody else, including the state. But as Thomas Jefferson becomes a very old man, he begins writing to Thomas Pickering and lots of other people that it's over. The experiment has failed, and it's failed because the banks are going to dominate um, the purchase of land, the purchase of capital equipment. And once the banks dominate these purchases, then private property will be a thing of the past. They will only be bank property. So Jefferson, as always, if you read his political theory, you finish by shaking your head because he ultimately doesn't say anything. He goes back and forth and contradicts himself given the political situation of the time. It's not his fault. It's just that as the Hamiltonian Federalists were going to win and impose the bank on people, or at least Jefferson thought that was going to be the case, he said, that's it. What, what we understand as republic, meaning private land ownership, which couldn't be any different than what this marriage of the sea is all about. Um, but that's how Jefferson viewed it. Uh, if, if that's our definition of republic and therefore maintaining uh, this kind of independence relative to the state and to each other, then if Hamilton wins and his friends win in the Federalist Party, it's over. And, of course, it's been over for a very long time. And that's why this is significant. And that's why, in true sense of the word, we deconstruct what the regime has for many centuries referred to as a republic with a capital R. Not the way Jefferson used it. Certainly not the way John Adams used it. Maybe the way Hamilton used it. Maybe the way Ben Franklin used it. Certainly the way the Venetians used it. So I, I appreciate you guys listening. I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.